This is the history of the Buick Grand National. In recent years, only two types of people can be found driving Buicks. Grandparents and college students whose recently deceased grandparents left them the car. We joke, but common perceptions about the brand don't recognize that in the 80s, enthusiasts lusted after Buicks in the same way that they lust today after BMWs, Audis, and other high-performance luxury cars. One of the crown jewels in Buick history is the Grand National, a hotted-up version of the Regal, which despite its short life, remains a favorite today. In 1982, Buick wanted to capitalize on the 81 and 82 wins in the NASCAR Grand National Series, and so it planned a run of only 100 Regal Grand Nationals. Cars and concepts ended up retrofitting 215 1982 Regals. The Grand Nationals sported red striping, two-tone gray paint, blackout wheel openings, and rocker panels, a new front air dam, and a new front splitter on the outside. Black leather Lear Siegler seats on the inside. Power came from a naturally aspirated 4.1 liter V6 that made a paltry 125 horsepower. While modern day Buick struggles to compete with the likes of Lexus and Acura, there was once a car with the Buick logo that muscle car enthusiasts dream of driving. Funny as it sounds now, in its era, this car used to give the Corvettes and other high-end sports cars a run for their money. This car is none other than the Buick Grand National. With a turbocharged V6 under the hood that helped gain quicker accelerations and a standard black paint job, that made the design of the Grand National more intimidating. This car is definitely considered as one of the true muscle cars during its heyday. To make matters worse, this car peaked in an era where Econo boxes reigned supreme and performance was an afterthought. The Grand National, in today's standards, is like a Shelby GT500, with both cars being a working man's supercar. So now you'll get the big picture how the Buick Grand National was in the 80s. Nothing charming could be said about the Grand National's exterior, as it looked like any GM car that rolled out during the late 80s. Yes, it did have distinguishing elements, like the Buick grille and Buick's Power 6 badge in the fenders and wheel centers. But overall, it looked like your run-of-the-mill 1980s slush box. The main feature, though, that made it unique was the color of all the elements. Each nook and cranny of the exterior was finished in jet black. Since the movie Return of the Jedi was released during the same time, People often refer to the Grand National as the Darth Buick, if it only had the laser guns and lightsabers. While its interior is an eyesore by today's standards, the right angles and upright binnacles covered in a leather print vinyl used to be the thing among the 80s motorheads. The one aspect that makes us easily forget the bland interior is the raw power that the Grand National oozes. GM was typically overly protective of its dearest Corvette, sometimes a way that makes us a little uncomfortable. But the Grand National was one of the few exceptions GM made to its standing protect the Corvette at all costs rule. This shot at the King was a bold move made by Buick that likely angered the boys at Chevrolet. Why should the Chevy boys been so ticked off? Here's why, by the model year. In 1982, the Regal Grand National debuted, but it is not really considered a true Grand National. Believe it or not, second to the LeSaver Grand National, this was the rarest of the bunch at only 215 units produced. If anyone tells you they have a 1983 Grand Natty, they're full of it, as there wasn't one built this year. In 1984, the Grand National actually started performing well, as it featured a 3.8-liter turbocharged V6 engine that pumped out 200 horsepower and 300 pound-foot of torque. For those not around in the 80s, you may be thinking, well, my Civic has 200 horsepower. What's so special? Keep in mind that this was the era when emissions choked power output to the point that even the mighty Corvette only produced 205 horsepower and 290 pound-foot of torque. The 1984 Grand National 
made the Corvette squirm in its fiberglass underpants with its 15.9 second quarter mile time, as that was only 0.8 seconds slower than GM's favorite child could pull off. And the Grand National still had some room to grow. In 1985, the Grand National carried over the 1984 specifications, but the Corvette saw a 25 horsepower bump. The Buick boys saw red and came back the following year. In 1986, Buick added in an air-to-air -air intercooler and tweaked the boost output to net the 3.8 liter V6 and extra 35 horsepower and 30 pound-foot of torque, bettering the mighty Corvette's base engine by 5 horsepower. The Corvette matched the Grand National output. The extra power pushed the Grand National to a new height, hitting 60 miles per hour in just 4.8 seconds and clearing a quarter mile in just 13.7 ticks of the second hand. That left the Corvette boys holding their jock straps at the starting line as the vet took 5.9 seconds to hit 60 miles per hour and cleared the quarter mile in 14.2 seconds. Then the GM battle for power really took hold. But we now know who ended up on top. In 1987, with Chevy breathing down Buick's neck about its precious Buick, decided to shelf the Grand National the following year. But not before going out in a blaze of horsepower glory. Two Grand Nationals hit the streets in 1987. The base model and the outrageous GNX model. The base Grand National hit 245 horsepower and 355 pound-foot of torque, and the GNX pumped out a mighty 276 horsepower and 360 pound-foot of torque. This netted the GNX a 0-60 to 60 time of 4.7 seconds and a quarter-mile time of 13.5 seconds. The base Grand National cleared the quarter in 14.23 seconds. Both numbers simply embarrassed the 1987 Corvette, as if the Buick sucker punched the American sports car in the gut and was shown the door. GM's long-standing first commandment is, Thou shall not victimize thy Corvette. And that commandment went so far as to halt the potential GM-Shelby relationship. Oddly enough, it couldn't squash its own sister company's attempt at putting its halo car to shame with a turbocharged box on wheels. Sure, the Corvette was sexier and handled the twist more effectively. In a straight line, however, the Grand National was pound for pound and dollar for dollar a better car than the C4 Vet. It's hard to put your thumb on exactly what kind of car it is. It was too plush to be a muscle car, but too ugly and bland to be a sports car or supercar. Seeing a glorified Buick Regal leaving Corvettes, Camaros, and Mustangs in its wake is hilarious, but strangely satisfying. The Grand National is one of few true legends that America has to brag about during the mid-80s, and it still amazes the muscle car enthusiasts even today. Well, there you have it, the history of the Buick Grand National. What was your favorite year? We'd like to know. Leave us a comment below and share this video. If you like this video, leave us a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit that bell to be notified of upcoming videos. Again, thanks for watching.